Oh, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> it is. You know what? Reverse Dude. polarity? No, it is not reverse polarity. I didn't switch that because I got a little bit of a headache tonight, but I got us fixed up now. It is Sound Advice, episode 10. It's me, your boy, High Five Vega. I'm joined by the two coolest dudes in DIY audio, Mr. Toyd and Mr. DIY audio guy himself. What's up, fellas? Hey, how much? What's going on, man? When you said the two, two coolest guys, I started looking around for who else was on the call yeah. with us. Who? <laughs> so, there's somebody behind you. You didn't see him. I, <laughs> I think he meant actually like coldest because we've been freezing the past week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So tonight, tonight we're talking about trends in DIY audio that we like and dislike. Who who has the feeling, the strongest feeling that they should go first? I don't, I don't have any strong feelings at the moment about, <laughs> about the order at which we go. You know, I mean, I, there's so many things that I like and don't like about audio that is crazy. And it's interesting, too, because when you say trend, to certain people, trends are different. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I look at a trend and I say, hey, there's a trend. And someone else goes, what? That's not a trend. And I'm like, it's not. It is to me. So... <laughs> Um, you know, I'll, I'll start us off with um, passive radiators. I, I feel like passive radiators the past uh, couple of years have really taken a hold in in home audio. Uh, it it wasn't long ago that you'd go on like a website like Parts Express and you'd look for passive radiators and they might have like one or two. Now they have like at least two pages to passive radiators and it's constantly getting more and more. You're seeing uh, speakers come out with them. CSS came out with their SDX 12 with dual um, passive radiators. That thing takes a thousand Watts hits 20 Hertz in room and in room can go all the way down to 10 Hertz. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think about. And so now you can get these much more powerful subwoofers and not have to worry about these ridiculously long vents to be able to get it to sound good. You can use these passive radiators. And to me, that's something I can really get behind because you get the better sound quality and you also can get those bigger, stronger woofers as well. So I like that. You know, I, it's, it's my opinion that most people make their port openings far too small. And, um, and that's a compromise because if the port opening gets bigger to keep the same tuning freaks me, you got to make the port longer. And I've got a video from back in December showing some, you know, some unreasonably long ports, you know, three foot long ports and stuff to kind of illustrate what happens when you when you start tinkering around with ports. And I would agree that uh, passive radiators are a currently a trend and a good trend. Uh, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong. Kicker recently came out with a new line probably a, a year ago of I think it was like a, a one of their type R's or comp R's type R's Alpine a comp R <laughs> and, a, and a passive radiator. They started selling those radiators. You can get them on Crutchfield. You can get them on Sonic Electronics um, and, and started making these little truck boxes again. And honestly, I, I've been looking for them, but I haven't seen them in a long time. And the last time I saw anything like that, they're these tiny little under seat boxes with a six and a half really wimpy woofer. And it seems to me the passive radiator is starting to make a comeback. Yeah, Kicker's been in passive radiators for a long time now, like as stuff they sell. But now they're kind of bringing it to the car audio DIY community with those new uh, passives that you're talking about. And they're relatively cheap. I think they're around 60 bucks, And uh, they come with the tuning weights and all this type of stuff. So it's something I need to explore myself because I don't do it as much as I should. I, I I'm not as versed in it as I should be because I, I think it is a trend and it's a good trend. I think it's a good trend too. It is harder, I think, for the DIY community in general to be able to tune one. If you don't have something like DATS, um, you're just hoping that WinISD is correct, basically. Uh, <laughs> and and that can or cannot be always the case. But hey, Rob, can you share my screen real quick? Yeah. So this is that SDX-12 dual passive radiator kit I was talking about. People actually use this in car audio and they use it um, in home audio. But you can just take a look at the SDX-12, how powerful that is. Now, you can actually buy... Uh, the subwoofer alone on Parts Express. I'm not sure if they sell the passive radiators there, but they sell it all on CSS's website. This is the kit that comes with the knockdown kit, and it's one inch thick. So I mean, they they don't mess around with this. And kit. that's what's does it say the airspace on that? Does two and a half cubic thing? feet. Well, I'm sorry, two point two cubic feet. Dude, that is for the frequency response you're getting out of that. That's pretty incredibly small enclosure. I, that's what I'm saying. It's unreal. I mean, can you imagine 
even putting one of those in your car, like that would be unreal. Just, I mean, it might blow your car apart. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, with, with their boss amp and the two kicker 12s. With their boss amp, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with their 50 watt. But yeah, I, I'm actually pretty, well, and the thing too is that sensitivity on that subwoofer is 87 decibels. Wow. So, so I mean, that's pretty sensitive for, you know, I mean, most of the time when you see a big magnet like that, you're looking at an 83 decibel subwoofer. So, I, I mean, I think 87 is pretty good. And if you watched yeah, my last video, which I posted today, you should, because it makes a lot of sense on why sensitivity is important and watts are less important. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, I was wanting to talk about power anyways. I hadn't got a chance to uh, catch your video yet. Cause I got, I, to be honest, I fell asleep on the chair after work because I had a crushing headache, man. It just wouldn't go away. But um, RMS, peak power, nominal power, what's it all mean? The, the I would say the trend, and we talked about this even on the Kicker Show last week, that RMS is not a true rating. But I do think in the nomenclature of what we do in car audio, it does have relevance even though it's the incorrect way to say it, you know, back in early or, you know, early 1900s, late 1800s, we would say literally in a totally different way than we mean it now. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, so I think there's like, it, it's, even though it's not the correct way, it kind of has been, a, it's morphed into what everyone considers the standard now. Yeah. It, it gets, it gets frustrating to me because I look at, I was trying to look for products that were, were doing this, right? We're trying to push that wattage number to be a little ridiculous. And Planet Audio came up a lot. Um, every single one of their products when I looked on Amazon all said max wattage, max wattage. And in fact, I didn't even see uh, an RMS wattage on any of their stuff. It's just max, 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 max. I'm like, great. Does that mean like if you shoot lightning through it or what? Like, I mean... What does that, what does that mean? Like, yeah. so yeah, that, that frustrates me because people see that number and then they want to add that power to it as well. And, and you know, that's yeah. when they blow things up or damage things. And it's just, you see, the thing is it's, it's perfectly fine. If you use the subwoofer from a same company that lies about their power rating <laughs> as the amplifier, because yeah. then they will be matched just fine. Uh, you, you won't have to worry about it. <laughs> and that was a genuine argument from Rockville at the time the big shenanigan happened. Um, that's what the argument they were putting out there was that if you match up their CEA rating to sub to amp, that everything was fine. Like, okay, but I mean, that just means you're lying about everything. Full of crap, but it, but yeah. it'll still work. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would say that I wouldn't look at either of those numbers. Um, RMS peak, nominal well not any of them uh, if it was me uh and here's the reason why because rms is dependent on the box you put it in yes that's absolutely that's, that's just what it comes down to and so when you look at this rms rating this rms rating is a thermal rating right so it's saying what right. the subwoofer can thermally handle it's not saying what it can handle when it's in a box and you'll see a lot of subwoofers when you'll model these um, whether it be from Parts Express, whether it be a car audio subwoofer from wherever, Amazon, wherever you go, Kicker, you'll have an RMS rating, but then you'll start modeling it in like WinISD and you'll notice, hey, in a sealed box, maybe it handles that, maybe it handles less, and in a ported, maybe even less. You know, And, and so you got to be careful with that RMS rating because just because it can thermally handle it doesn't mean once you put it in that box that it can still handle that load. Right. You know, and right. Justin, you had a very good video on this. Can you kind of give us the elevator pitch of what RMS so, actually means, what max power and all that? So RMS stands for root mean squared. And the, the actual calculation involves measuring the voltage at random points along a sine wave mm. and squaring those measurements. And you do that because half the time the voltage is negative. And if you just add a negative and a positive of the same size, negative one plus positive one is zero, right? So uh, we see RMS in statistics uh, when we do least squares estimation, don't mean to get too far off topic, but it's a trick that's used all over the place. Anytime you've got numbers where you've got positive and negatives kind of 
uniformly around zero, you have to use something like RMS. So you square all the numbers and that gives rid of all the negatives then average them and then take the square root. That's where you get root mean square. It's the square root of the mean of the squares. And it turns out that it, uh, the peak voltage, all right, if you just multiply that by 0 0.707, you'll get the uh, RMS voltage. And so it turns out to be a pretty you know, natural, easy thing to do. Um, and what's really kind of cool about the whole RMS versus max versus whatever debate is, you know, max and peak mean nothing, they're marketing terms. If you're buying amps from an honest manufacturer that puts a max number on there, the max has to be double what RMS is. As it turns out to just to work out that way mathematically. Um, and, and the other thing to kind of consider about that is RMS voltage, because amplifiers you know, put out voltage and they don't do any work and create power until you run through a speaker, right? Uh, RMS voltage should give you the exact same amount of power as that same voltage DC. Uh, and so if your RMS voltage is you know, 10 volts, uh, you're going to make the same amount of heat if you're running your power through a resistor as if you're running 10 volts DC. Um, yeah. And I hope that wasn't too technical. <laughs> it's, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I find it interesting as well, because even when you're figuring out RMS, one of the people that I know all of us watch is uh, is Derek Wilson of Wilson Audio Labs. And it'll be interesting, too, because that RMS is still dependent on a frequency at which they test it at, right? Yeah. So it yeah. depends if it's one kilohertz, 40 kilohertz. And I, I remember seeing quite a few of his videos that said, hey, you know what? We didn't get it at this frequency. Let's test this frequency and see if we get it now. Um, and that's important too, because not every manufacturer, even when you're looking at that number, is testing it the same, although they should. I mean, typically a full range should be one kilohertz and a subwoofer should be 40 kilohertz. Uh, you know, one kilohertz is just easier to push. So some people will do that RMS number because it's it's easier to push. And it's it's unfortunate because it, it really does really muddy the waters when people want to want to <laughs> find out what they're doing. I, I'm going to share this with you guys real quick. There was this great article called Attack of the Clone Amplifiers by Audioholics. And it was all using ice powered amplifiers all the manufacturers used the exact same amplifier board and they all picked different ways of showing the power output based off the information that ice power gave them. They didn't even do their own testing. They just looked at ice powers ratings and said, Oh, we're going to give this number out or we're going to give this number out. And so often they were actually different the, than the others when in reality they were the exact same board. And, you know, we call this a trend, but this has been going on for decades. I remember in the 1990s when I was a kid dreaming of the day I can afford to put an amp in a car, people talking about this. Oh, you got to go with RMS, not peak. You, you know, just because it says a thousand watts on the box doesn't mean you can, or back then it would have been a hundred watts on the box doesn't mean <laughs> you can do a hundred watts. Yeah. And I think that the RMS is more apt to go towards amplifiers than speakers in general. Like speakers, I like talking about nominal power because typically when they tell you nominal power, they're giving you a range. Like it can handle from 300 to 500 or something like that. RMS, again, on on amps, it, I think it fits better, but it's still it's still not perfect. Like you said, it's, it's frequency dependent. People are under the assumption that if it doesn't meet its rating, so if it's 10% under, on its ratings and they're not even looking at the voltage. We might not have gave it the 14.4 four, volts. It may have been 14 volts flat, but they, they're under the impression if it makes it by 10%, it, it failed. Well, it didn't. Even if we supplied it the 14.4 volts, there is a manufacturing tolerance. And, you know, 10% is maybe a little too much, but 5%, I would say, is, you know, that they can't make every amp do the same amount of power. I mean, there has no. to be, I mean, I mean when I even think about when you order capacitors from parts express for crossovers, there's a tolerance on the capacitor. Yeah. yeah. What's an amp full of when, when big D opens an amp up and shows it off capacitors, capacitors. everywhere. Well, it, it, everything has a tolerance. It doesn't matter what it is, but um, the truth of the matter too is yes, that's exactly right. The, um, the truth of the matter is too. I mean, when you watch those amplifier videos, it, it's not, unusual for one side of the amp to get more power than the other side as well. Yeah. And that's because of the, the tolerances there. There's going to be a tolerance there. 
And and Andy is is spot on with his beginners love max power ratings because they can show off like, hey, I got a fifteen hundred watt amp, man. Check it out. This well, is what it, I, says it says it on the outside. Well, and they don't understand it, um, and that's the problem with with it. And and that's what I hate about it is because it's become a trend in audio. It doesn't matter if it's home audio or car audio. I remember even back in the day when I was selling, there would be home theater in a boxes right being sold, and they'd say. 1000 watts of power. They were like the tiniest, crappiest little speakers ever with this little five inch subwoofer. And yet it's got a thousand watts of power. And it not only is it ridiculous to think that it has a thousand watts of power. If it, if that needed a thousand watts of power, that's the most inefficient system I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> like it's just band speaker systems. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's crazy. But you know what? People would buy that one over a name brand system sitting right next to it that would be even cheaper than that one, but much, much better because that one said it had a thousand Watts and the other one was realistic and said, look, we have 400 Watts of power going to this. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's what, that's what I feel my spot is when, when I'm testing something, I don't do a lot of amp dynos. Uh, I try not to, I, that's kind of like Derek's thing. And I don't, I'm more of a DIY guy, but when I do, I feel like that's my spot. So I'm here to educate people a little bit like, okay, this may say this, but this is what you're actually getting. It's fine if you want this. Just know what you're getting. This is what you're getting. You're not you, getting what it says on the box a lot of times. You actually did that with your last video today that came out. So, yeah. yeah, if you want to buy it for 25 bucks, it's it's a decent deal. But just know what you're getting. You're not getting that. Yeah. Force. And, and I'm not going to tell you what you're not going to get because you got to watch the video. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, see – I, I don't want to like if people love cheap equipment, that's fine with me. You know, they, they've got totally got the right to do it. But I also don't want them thinking that they're getting something that they're not. That's where I feel like if they know what they're getting and they still buy it, totally cool with that. If it and sounds too right good there. to be true, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right there with that. I mean, I know. I know when I buy that clamp at Harbor Freight, there's a greater chance that it's going to fail, but it's also, you know, a third of the price of the same clamp at Lowe's. That's yeah. just, everyone plays that game. Yeah, uh, as long as you know what you're getting on. And I think I just that's... thought of, um, Andy, Andy reminded me of this since he's our, our kicker fanboy in the room. Um, have y'all seen uh, Parker Dashell has been putting out a series of videos where he's been buying progressively nicer, higher line kicker subwoofers? and putting it on his giant Terra Amps 12 bazillion K yeah. amplifier. And I am stunned at the amount of power those things take. He is throwing, you know, they're short burps kind of thing. He's throwing 4,000 watts at these subs rated 400 RMS. And they're taking it like a champ. Yeah. Have y'all seen those? Yeah, yeah. I've wa I haven't watched the most current one, but I've watched the, the last two. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a, And, you know, it's, it's good that he's doing that because – like me, if I if I have those subs, I'm never gonna do it bass head justice, out because I'm just not. I'm, that's not the way I am. That's not the way I enjoy my music. But I'm glad to see that people that do enjoy it take something seriously. And it's like, hey, this is the way we do it, and I, I'm gonna test this in this certain way. Yeah, and you know, I think that's once again where you come back to good brands. You know, knowing what you're gonna get. Sometimes it, it can be scary if you haven't heard of the brand, and they're saying things that sound a little bit unreal they probably are i can't say it always but they probably are um tang band has always been one of my favorites for bass because they usually underrate their power uh which is great i mean they, they can actually handle more power than what they typically say and typically when i see those rms power ratings it's in box power rating it's not you know that thermal yeah. power rating which i which i appreciate at Parker Lewis can't lose. That, that's a good shout. Out. That's a deep cut. I, I used to watch that show too. This uh, this Tang Man back here, I was uh, thinking about rebuilding it and I was doing some modeling <laughs> and I didn't notice it the first time I built it. But um, you know, just like just like Nick said, the power it'll do in the box is different. And I can't I can't make a box where I can drive that thing to over excursion. I you know what I mean. I'm, I'm just stunned by that. So I know it gets rated at 50 watts. It'll do 100. I'll, I'll be confident throwing that. Is no problem. I have this yeah. right here, which I actually forgot about. Where was it? Ah, this is a, the, the W5, and I'm, I gave it a passive radiator. Notice it's a huge passive radiator compared to this, and that's because 
this needs a huge passive radiator because of how much this can push. Yeah. I can give this, I mean, I don't even know. I mean, I'm giving this well over the, the 50, 40, I guess it's continued 40 watts RMS. And um, I mean, I'm not having any issues with either of these things. I mean, it's just crazy. It's not bottoming out, not distorting, you just take it. And it <laughs> No, but you know what? That's the problem with the tank bands, though, is often the port, the port size, right? So we have to right. worry about the port size. And, and with this passive radiator now, I have that basically the same size box, but don't have to worry about that anymore. This is a half cubic foot box. The port is 23 inches long. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's crazy, but you need just, it because it can push so much air. It's a one yeah. by seven port and it's 23 inches long. It's, it's, it wraps all the way around the inside of the box. Yeah, it's almost almost transmission line levels there. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I, I figured I'll start off with the first dislike that I have or trend I dislike. And I feel like you guys might agree with me. It's it's the hate. Like we're a DIY audio community, car audio, mm -hmm. home audio. There's a lot of people like just if they see a certain piece of equipment, they automatically hate. They if you're not using this you're trash. If you are using this, you're trash. And I don't know how bad it is in the home audio uh, arena, but in the audio arena, it's, it's terrible. And it's like, you know, I always, I always see this as a community. So no one's greater than the other. Be just because he runs boss audio, one guy runs boss audio, one guy runs sundown, one guy runs kicker. We're all in this for the same thing. And it's just like, you see it every single day in the karate community. Imagine how far we could get if we didn't hate, but we just kind of were like, hey, man, we're enjoying the same hobby. Cool. You know, you could maybe improve by doing this or that. But also you got to when, when you're saying these things, you also got to think about how it's coming out or how someone would read it. Yeah, it, I think in the home audio community and DIY, it's almost it's it's a little different, but it's it's the same thing. It's when someone tries to do something on their own and they go away from kits. Right. Sergio, and the people that really know what they're doing start really bashing on their design or start saying, you're just not ready for that yet. You're an idiot. You know, those types of things. It's kind of like, you know, I mean, is that really the best thing to, to push them into like really enjoying this hobby or can we just help them kind of figure out where they went wrong and, and help push them back towards the edge because the truth of the matter is that there are people that jump in a little bit too fast and that's okay but i mean just like anyone else hopefully you're going to send them a life raft you're not going to just watch them drown so that's mine it, you're uh, muted justin i was wondering i thought i seen them talking but i didn't hear no no words coming out yeah justin you're muted yeah, <laughs> there it's, you it's go. confession time. Uh, <laughs> every now and then when I see someone who's done something terrible and taking a picture of it, and not trying to sell their amp on Facebook Marketplace, I'll do a screen grab and throw it up on Instagram because yeah. it gets lots. And I'm yeah. just going to stop doing that because, you know, it's not their fault that they it's things like, you know, the, the power wire that's been stripped back three inches and is hanging out of the amplifier yeah. terminals and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's not right. I shouldn't do that. Well, um, you know, there is a fine line now because. I'm all about razzing somebody about something, but there's a way you can do that in a friendly way and not just absolutely trash them. You know, like, like uh, you might see every now and again, someone makes fun of me using CCA in the Hyundai, you know, <laughs> to me, that's funny to me. That's funny. But that I know that we're all friends here. That's, that's where you draw a lot. Like when we're, when we're doing it to just, uh, just to t don't tear people down, build stuff up, you know, try not to tear down. Yeah. I mean, heck, I just used four GRS subwoofers to make a ridiculously awesome $100, $80 subwoofer, you know, and that's definitely a subwoofer in the home audio world that most people would be like, eh, I don't know, you know, but <laughs> dude, it sounds great. You know, it's fantastic yeah. for what it is for the price. It's, you can't go wrong with it. And, uh, it, you know, yeah, I mean, and the thing is that video, you know, you've told us that it's done really well. A lot of people are watching that video and, and yeah. you know, people are watching it because they're liking it. Um, so obviously they're, that's perfectly fine to take four inexpensive drivers and turn them into something awesome. Yeah. Well, and we should be, I mean, you know, one of the things that I, I have a hard time with is people that feel like they know everything in, in this already. Uh, hopefully we're still learning from each other. 
Um, for example, a lot of people commented on that video saying, hey, isobaric is really not used anymore. And that's true. Some isobarics are not used anymore and not necessarily, uh, oh, geez, not necessary. But there can still be reasons to use it. And to be able to bring those types of trends back to the forefront, I think I think is great. I mean, it's much cheaper to do an isobaric with a GRS subwoofer than it would be to buy, you know, a bunch of more expensive subwoofers to get the same result. Well, plus how, how boring is the world if we all just do the same exact thing? I agree, yeah. You know, it's like, hey, I got shame whenever I've done the ISO box. It's like, yo, man, I understand that it's not going to be as loud as two of these if these drivers individually in their optimal enclosure. That's not what I've done it for. I've done it because I want to do something different, and I want to have some fun, and, and this is a hobby. I didn't know if you knew that or not, but this is a hobby that I do for fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not – we shouldn't have to conform to how someone else likes it done. It should be yeah. all about continuing and doing whatever you want. So like I like high efficiency speakers and I think in the home theater area, high efficiency speakers are really making a huge comeback. That's a trend that I really like. Uh, JTR speakers is one that's really doing that. Quite a few other people are doing that. Um, I, I built some already the Klipsch clones and the, um, I don't remember uh, the uh, soundstage 15, They're all, all fantastic speakers, but, um, you may not like high efficiency speakers. That's fine. Don't build them. <laughs> you know. Thanks, El Fuego. I, I'm going to try to keep from the fires. The the high efficiency speakers, I like that too. And in car audio, I really like it in car audio. Um, the only thing that kind of sucks about the high efficiency speakers in car audio is you're using a DIY driver, and they're not always moisture rated. Yeah. And that can cause issue over time, but honestly, you can get them so cheap to me that it's not that big of a diff determining factor. Or maybe not UV rated or whatever. Yeah, you know, had the UV coating on it. Yeah, I don't know if a if a if a speaker in a car can't survive for five years, it doesn't bother me. I'm going to take it out in less than five years. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's like, I'm going to I want to try a different speaker. You know, as soon as I put yeah. it in, it's like that sounds great. I wonder what some other speaker sounds like. Let me go get one and put it in here. Well, yeah. you know, with with the addition of DSP now, I would love to see some more high efficiency subwoofers in in cars because you can do a lot with that DSP, especially if you're looking at like a PA speaker that is really highly rated, 99 decibel speaker rated you know, at 1500 Watts or whatever RMS, you might be able to do some really nasty stuff with that. This is, this is kind of, this used to be a pet peeve of mine when someone's like, well, will this, will this subwoofer do 1000 Watts or, you know, they, they, you know what they're saying, you know, they're, they're, they're meaning what they say and they're saying what they mean. It's just when they say it like that, it kind of gets me, but I've learned to let that just roll off my back because I know what they're trying to say, even though when or when they call like a mid range or a uh, full range amp, like a voice amp, <laughs> that's another one that used to get me too. voice amps. And yeah. Yeah, there, there's a lot of trends that we don't like. But what about more trends that we do like? Because there are a lot of really cool trends now that I think are pretty cool, including DSP, which I, yeah. I, I, I think is a good trend that's going on in both car and home audio because you're able to get a lot more out of even cheaper drivers than, than you're able to, you know, five years down the road, five years yeah, previously down the road. And I'm thrilled with the rise of cheap DSPs, things like a yeah. mini DSP two by four. Uh, now you can't do much with four channels of DSP, but wow, you got four channels of DSP for just over a hundred bucks. I mean, right. that's, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. That's a front Ooh. stage in a car. I mean, I, I'm for like DSP, everything. Even if it's bad, I see. I, I used to be like this on TVs. Th I'm getting somewhere with this analogy. So, <laughs> at, originally, like the built in Roku's, they didn't have Roku's and stuff like that before in TVs, but it was their built in software. I hated that stuff. I just wanted a dumb TV. I'll put whatever box I want on it. But over time, as these TVs have been coming out with Roku and built in Google or whatever it may be, I've noticed that it gets people to actually use it because it's built into the TV. They don't have to go get a box. And I think the same thing kind of rings true to car audio, to home audio, DIY, whatever you're doing, that if you have it already built in, 
people are apt to at least try it more. And then maybe they can graduate from the beginning DSP to the little upgraded DSP. Now, maybe instead of four channels, they want six or eight. And now maybe, you know, they want to step it up a bit. Yeah, I agree. And in fact, one of the DSPs that I really enjoy is the DSP LF. I really wish uh, some more people would use it in their car because I think that it's a good thing because you can manually tune it however you want. Yeah. And you can add as much. So you can tune it to whatever you think is best for your car or whatever. Uh, now you can do the auto DSP. I'm not sure in car audio, unless you're going for sound quality, that that's going to be uh, a fantastic choice for you. Of course, you need an eye device for that too, but it's $60. I mean, talk about one of the cheapest DSP units you can get. Um, I don't know. To me, I, I like it. I use it in my home theater and I, I love, I love it. What do you think about it, Justin? I, I'm a big fan of, of, uh, of DSP. Definitely one of the things that I like. Um, you know, I, I, the other big thing that I like is I like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. I love the convenience of being able to sync my phone to the head unit in the car, have the map, have the calling, have everything, and it just work. And it just seems to work just fine. Yeah. And the cool thing, too, is it seems like DSP is now being integrated into most electronics. The concern always is when that happens is that the quality will start to fall down. You saw that with a lot of technologies that I personally loved, like 3D technology. I loved 3D technology. I know most people hated it, but that's because most people had really crappy 3D technology. It's yeah. just true, unfortunately. But everyone said, oh, to sell our TV, we have to have 3D on it. So we're just going to throw the crappiest 3D in the world and say, here you go. And then people saw it and said, this is junk. But if you saw it on like a DLP projector, you're like, your mind was blown. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh. And then... Uh, you know, same with DSP. I mean, when you get really bad DSP, you know, it, that's that's my only concern is that DSP will end up following those same trends that we see a lot in audio and video world. Yeah, and it already has a bit if you're going by what the car audio manufacturers are doing because they're EQing their systems and running all pass filters and all this nonsense, making it much more difficult for you to put your system in. But the I will say where they have the edge is like Android Auto and CarPlay. Yeah. And I don't have any vehicles with that, but I think that's very good because for one, like every car audio manufacturer, even the ones I love, your software sucks. It just <laughs> sucks. And um, I wish that you could do a better job at it. I don't know what it is, but every I've had problems with every single issue or with every single software I've used whether it be lagging input, you know, just the user interface in general, uh, having to dive in three or four menus to get a simple function. I think that Android and iPhone operating system, iOS, has their light years ahead of anything any car audio manufacturer has done. And for that matter, I think uh, the same when it comes to car manufacturers in general. And, and it adds easy, hands-free stuff, which before – adding hands-free to, you know, head units that weren't factory installed was, it was awful. Um, but yeah, I like, I love the fact that it's like simple, easy integration. I have an Android auto head unit on one of my cars and I absolutely love it. It uses a Linux based system. So it doesn't use anything, you know, as far as, um, you know, memory or anything. It's, it's very fast moving system and it's cheap too. It wasn't a very expensive unit, but I'd like to I like to get a little bit nicer one. Go boom. He likes the trend of crowd of YouTubers and influence like us. Big D, XO, Sundown, SQLG. Appreciate you, man. Me too. Yeah. I like that trend. <laughs> I still have a hard time thinking of myself as an influencer. I'm just yeah. I'm just a dude out in the garage with some power tools, just having a good time. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, I, I thought that I felt that same way. And I still do, honestly. But when you start to see like what you say influencing people's opinions, you're like, oh, maybe I should really think about what I put out there <laughs> because yeah. it, it could certainly influence someone one way or the other. And, you know, I like to joke and I do a lot of deadpan jokes where people don't know what I'm actually mean. <laughs> and that could be bad. So I have to think about it sometimes when I'm doing this. 
And unfortunately, the ones that you really wish would be influenced more often aren't. Like the, the video yeah. I put out today, I know it's not going to do that great, and I wish it would because I think it a lot of people need to need to see it and and hear it. Yeah, I think DSP, maybe maybe, um, maybe we should. Oh, go ahead, get Larry's comment. I was going to say that he says DSP is being overused to fill giant holes where there should be more or better speakers. One hundred percent true. They're cheating us, uh, like the car audio manuf car manufacturers. They're cheating us every way they can. And Bluetooth speakers. Yeah. You know, psychoacoustics is what we could, what we would call it. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> and, and the other thing, too, about, you know, the, 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 the auto manufacturers and their DSP, it's a lot cheaper to hire a programmer to program DSP for that particular car and then put in a million crappy speakers in the quarter million cars they sell than it is to put really great speakers to begin with in those cars. Yeah, sure, for sure. I mean, that's if you look at you know, you just watch a car audio, a five star car stereo, and every door that comes off, there's this overbuilt mounting for that factory speaker with this little flimsy paper cone, mm -hmm. <laughs> tiny magnet speaker. Like, there's more money in the mount and the engineering and the around the speaker than is actually in the speaker. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> actually, I am because you guys hate CCA. Yeah, there you Trump go. Has been done. Um, I don't know as much about car audio, but in home audio, there's always seems to be a new standard that comes out every X amount of years, right? Uh, there's like Dolby Digital, Dolby, well, Dolby Pro Logic, Dolby Digital, uh, you know, DTSX, and then you have, of course, your Dolby True HD, and now you have Dolby Atmos. Um, Atmos is the first time that I've really felt like the jump is really, really worth it. I, I love Atmos. Uh, I really do. However, there's a caveat to that. Most people are not going to get very good Atmos in their house. That's just the truth. And there's a couple reasons for that. One being low ceilings, but two being most people are, are using these up firing units. So basically what they do is they stick them on their sub or their speaker and it shoots up at the ceiling and they hope that it projects down in the right area to get that sound correctly there's actually believe it or not if you design speakers like that they actually have a specific notch filter that you have to have on it that's supposed to make this work and it, it doesn't I, i've never well let me put it this way i have never really found one that works well now i have atmos down in my basement oh well it's not a basement it's first floor we don't have basements in tennessee but in my first floor and we have nine foot high ceilings and i have in ceiling speakers for the atmos and i love it I mean, even even the faux Atmos, like the, the movies that aren't actually Atmos are awesome. I mean, it's amazing. And so it's the first like audio trend new standard that's come out that I'm like, yes, I am all for. And I'm afraid that it's going to go by the wayside if people don't start getting, you know, real Atmos because these, these upfiring units, I, I just don't think they work. And, and I would tell you, don't waste your money on it. If you can't put in ceiling speakers in it, just forget about Atmos for the time being. But if you can do Atmos, or if you can hang some from the ceiling, you know I've never I've never heard one. And I Atmos guess I need to tape. hear one before I judge. Oh, but really. just the physics of it, you know, a, a speaker sitting on top of your of your home theater tower firing up. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> There's no way the physics could possibly work to make that sound as intended, unless the intention was for it to sound like crap. So I'm going to answer this quick because 25 Hertz to Life said Atmos or THX and Jesse said 5.2.4 is amazing. By the way, Jesse, I agree. Love it. I mean, if you've never heard that going over your head, like I started the beginning of um, what's that Shelby, the Shelby Ford one, Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah. 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 I mean, it sounds like you're right there. The car's going right over your head. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You feel like you're right there sitting track side with the, I mean, it's it's just unbelievable. Having said that, THX is is more of a, a standard as far as like how you hook up your speakers, like an 80 hertz crossover. Certain speakers should be small, certain speakers should be large. This is where you should place them. Where Atmos is is actually a a sound um, like DSP, basically, where yeah. you know it's going to take your sound and and just tell what speakers what to play. And so it's it's a little it's a little different. I don't really know how to explain that any better than what I just did, which might have confused people a little bit more than it probably should have.
<laughs> well, you know, Joaquin says it here. He's a 2.1 guy. Man, mm-hmm. I am I am just I never got into home theater for for whatever reason. I guess it might be car audio. I've just always been like a two channel guy. I like headphones. I like I don't like the headphones that do the 5.1. I just like regular headphones. I like, you know, two speakers in a car yeah, or two well, channels in a car. If you ever come out, I'll let you listen to real surround sound. And then you can change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> then you can be like, oh, crap, 2.1. Yeah. Dang, I've been missing out. Like, yeah, all, like, I've got, all I've got is a 5.1 system. Uh, my, my surround sound is not that special. But one of the first times I had hooked up and working, it came with a calibration microphone to get all the distances right. So it's got a little built-in DSP functionality. Yeah. And we sit down and we turn it on. And we watch a Simpsons episode. And Marge Simpson was in the middle of the screen and walked off screen. And you could hear the footsteps just follow her. And my wife was all like, oh, I understand why you, <laughs> why you think we need this now. That was, a, that was amazing. And it's like, yes, exactly. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And I yeah. just have my simple. Polk sound bar that just makes the TV louder. That's it. <laughs> and on the bad side, like the voices don't come through. Like they should. It's like, I want to hear the voices. I don't care about the sound effects. Yeah. I I got to say, well, first of all, you know, people are making fun of THX in there. And, and really, THX kind of went by the way. So, I mean, THX still exists. Don't get me wrong. And I still like the THX standard to a large degree because you're usually asking your speakers not to do more than what they should, which is nice. Um, you know, cross them over at 80 hertz when most people want to try to cross them over at 40 because they want that bass out of there, but all you're getting is distortion from those tower speakers or whatnot. So I, I don't know, but really, I, it doesn't really matter. Like we said earlier, set it up the way you like to listen to it. Uh, I have a friend who has some definitive technology towers and he could run them either the bottom subwoofer part as a subwoofer or as a full range speaker. And I said, look, set it up the way you like it. It, it doesn't matter what anyone else tells you. Just do what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Don't listen to I, everyone on the internet. Just test it out and then decide for yourself. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that that's on anything. You should always at least try something to know where what you like and what you don't like without someone telling you what you should like or what you don't like. But I did see Justin had a nice like that I like. Clean wire. Braided <laughs> loom. Now, see, I'm on the fence about bra- using braided loom myself. I love the way it looks. Oh, but yeah. it's kind of a pain to work with. Oh yeah. When you put, and, <laughs> and when you put heat shrink on it, like if you're not careful, mm-hmm. I, I like that new concepts heat shrink, and it's a three to one. It's adhesive lined. Yeah. And it's transparent, but you got to put so much heat on it that a lot of times I end up burning the or burning through the the braided loom. So yeah, I, I like the way, like that when that it's done time. nice. When yeah. it, when it's done nice, I like the way it looks, but I don't know about for myself how how I want to do it. So, you know what someone else has taught me about doing that, you know, like if you're doing that braided stuff, instead of doing like what you're doing, is like burning it. You can just take some black electrical tape, do the end, rip it off, and then put your uh, pants, your cable pants on. It covers over it anyway. Unless I'm... Oh, yeah. Well, in car audio, you'll typically, like you'll use a, a barrel, like a ferrule. Oh, gotcha. To crimp, so you want to have that the heat shrink kind of holding that frail in to crimp it into it. And you, right, you right. can, you can do it without burning the braided loom, but it, it takes a little bit of patience. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky, but the thing is that it, it, you can make it look nice. And the thing I like the most about the clean wire trend is a good clean wiring job. First of all, it's hard to do. If you've never tried it, you don't know how hard it is to do this. It takes far more zip ties than you imagine. And, um, you know, if it looks nice, it's going to be the wires in the car are going to be run along factory wiring. They're not going to stand out. Nothing's going to pinch. Nothing's going to snag. And it's just going to look a lot better. And I think it's a great trend. And I wish more people would would do it instead of just do haphazard wire jobs. And this is coming from someone who the first few times I ran amplifier wires, it looked like crap. And it, and after I finished it, I looked at it and I thought, that looks nothing like the car audio magazine said it's supposed to look. <laughs> what the hell did I do wrong? Um, and it wasn't until the age of YouTube that you could actually watch someone do it and go, oh, okay, instead of using, you know, the four zip ties that came in the amp kit, you got to run, go get a case of the darn things. From Harbor <laughs> Freight for 
bucks. Yeah. You got to use 400 of them. And then, hey, it's going to it's gonna look great. The wires are going to sit where you want them to sit. And it's something we all ought to be doing, home and car audio both. Well, um, I, I think, you know, people say, well, it doesn't actually do anything to, you know, but it does make it look better. And even like when I just showed how to uh, make hi-fi speaker wire, you know, which is just one, one wire, not, you know, not all of your cables together, but just one wire. Um, it just makes you feel better about your system. Even though there's no yeah. increase in sound quality, it just does. <laughs> it's easier to run the power wire through the uh, fender. Well, yeah, man. <laughs> And, and this this is a good question. How much protection does Brady Loom provide? Almost None. nothing. <laughs> yeah. No, nothing. And, and it's I think the aesthetic is important though, because for one thing, it allows you to buy one color of wire. You can right. buy a fifty foot roll of one color of wire, and you can change it with the the loom. Secondly, you look at this every day, and you don't want to buy something. And you know your amp. Say you've got a Macintosh amp. The Macintosh amp is beautiful. And now you've got all this black wire coming out of it because you've got a you know a good deal on some quality wire, and it's just like, yeah, it, or black and and red, or why not throw some loom on there, throw some nice uh, ferrules on there, some heat shrink, make it look nice and professional. It just makes it lets people know you went the extra step. You didn't just hook wire up, and call it good. You know, when I when I lift the back seat of my truck up and show friends the the wires and the amplifiers, everyone says, "Oh wow!" And my and my and my wire is not that clean. It's still it's still a bit of a tangled mess. It's only oh, it's about ten or fifteen percent spaghetti at this point, I think. But still, the, those main mm. power runs are all zip tied down. They're all they're they're not coming loose. Not going to snag on anything. It, it just looks better. Yeah, yeah, and it does make you feel better about your system. It really does. I I, I don't care if it's home audio or car audio. It just makes you feel better. Guys, there's one other trend I was curious about. Um, Class D amplifiers. How do you guys feel about that? Good, bad, and different. I think it's actually really great. Um, a lot of people, me being an old school guy, might think that I think the other way, and and I did for a time. But I've had so much experience with new Class D amps that I can tell you that they sound just as good, a good Class D amp sound just as good as some of the old stuff that we used to love back in the day because it's it's more efficient. The efficiency is key. The size is key. You can get smaller amps in places with double the power than you used to be able to get. So I think it's better uh, overall now, but there is some drawbacks because there's still cheap D out. There's still cheap D, class D out there. So well, sure. I think that's also an advantage though, because even though there's cheap class D, it gets people in the door uh, where back in the day, you know, it wouldn't. And, and there's a lot of people that really like the cheap class D's, even though sound quality wise, they're not the best. Right. I mean, we all know that, mm -hmm. but I think it does get people in the door that, that wouldn't normally get into DIY audio because they can buy, you know, a Bluetooth amplifier, or whatever, you know, someone was saying earlier that, Hey, why even need a head unit now? If I can buy a class D amplifier with Bluetooth auxiliary and everything in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's got, you know, somewhat of a point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking long and hard the next time I do an upgrade in my truck, I'm not going to put a head unit. I'm just going to go right to an iPad in the dash mm. um, and, and, and run it to the DSP from there. Like, what do I need? Cause I, I never turn on AM FM radio. I never put a CD in. What, what do I need a head unit for? What's it even doing for me? The volume knob. That, oh that's yeah, that's the, it. That's the, that's the best part, man. <laughs> that is the best part. <laughs> it, it sucks. It's like, the iPad thing, I really wish that they had a nice interface. Like, like I, like I told, I told Kicker, I told Kip, I was like, you guys should make a awesome app that's meant to be used on an iPad instead of a head unit, because I think that would be that'd be pretty cool. It'd be even cooler if it could also work off an Android. Yes. Well, obviously, <laughs> you make you got to make for you got to make for everything, but nobody buys Android tablets. What are you talking about? That's just Everyone a stone fact. That is not, I have an Android tablet. Oh, I'm so, sorry. so there's at least one person that buys them. I'm so sorry for you guys. You I'm shouldn't be. We sorry you it. had to deal with that. <laughs> Best purchase ever. <laughs> <laughs> so seriously though, I, I think class D amplifiers are great. There's, and the thing is with class D amplifiers, people that want to even get in DIY speaker building for like little desktop speakers and want to buy a cheap, 
Like you can buy SMSL, which makes some really great little amplifiers that have volume knobs, Bluetooth, you know, even DAX built in for like a hundred bucks now. You know, I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Ice Power is available on Parts Express. You guys know how I feel about Ice Power. They're they're literally rated as hi-fi amplifiers. So you can actually buy hi-fi amplifier boards now, which is crazy. I mean, it's just, you know, back in the day, these are things that we couldn't do. So I love the fact that Class D is coming out there. Hypex is another brand you can buy. It's just it's just fantastic to be able to see what you can and can't do and, and the price you can do it at. And the fact that they run cool. You don't have to have all these ridiculously loud fans going on when you're listening to your system either. Cool it down. Yeah, for sure. Although there is some pretty efficient class A B amps, and there's some pretty efficient inefficient class D amps, as you, have you seen that I've tested. But there's different times when you know, like a regulated power supply might kill your efficiency. But people don't always understand like what amps what. And I think that's kind of like it's like on me to explain to them, like, hey, this efficiency is low because it's regulated you may get an unregulated amp with more efficiency, but you may also draw more amperage in the long run. So it's it's kind of hard to explain that in every single video, but I do feel like the onus is on me to kind of explain it when someone sees something that's either low efficiency or super high efficiency. You know, in, in a car setup, you know, amplifier power has gotten really cheap, but one thing that hasn't gotten cheap is aftermarket alternators and uh, batteries. Um, so sure, get a huge amplifier. Yeah, it's efficient. It's a class D, and I can afford thousands of watts. But your stock alternator can't produce enough amperage to give you those thousands of watts. And so the idea of an efficient class D amplifier matched well to your factory system, it just it just really makes sense, especially mine the can. Ones. My alternator and can do it easily. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> I've got an awesome alternator. Don't make fun of mine. <laughs> I know your alternator shaming them. <laughs> your, your, alternator. your alternator shaming, shaming Nick. Yeah. No, but that's, that's right. true, you know. And me as the guy that just never run over fifteen hundred watts to a subwoofer in a car, um, like for long terms, I've done it in the short term. But yeah, I mean, that's never been a concern for me because, simply put, I've never needed that much power. Now these guys are buying three, four, five thousand watt amps for 300 bucks you know three four five hundred bucks and then they're putting it on a 90 amp alternator and an ultima and it's you're gonna have a bad time or a good time for very short yeah <laughs> <laughs> possibly have a good time calling a tow truck <laughs> yes yeah. and the, the the problem you get into is like you can order one off ebay well this ebay's telling you it's 200 amps uh and it's 180 bucks but what they don't tell you is that 200 amps may not come till 6,000 RPM. So at <laughs> idle, you may still be at, I've seen them tested at idle where they were lower than the factory idle oh, wow. amps or uh, alternators. So you got to be careful. You got to get a quality one. And like Justin said, a quality one's not cheap. You're looking at minimum of three to three fifty, upwards of 700, $800. And if, if I were to oh, install the alternator yourself, um, you, you know, don't fool with it because you're going to be going to a shop to have alternators switched out because those things, even the high quality ones are going to fail at a higher rate than the factory one. So if I were to come back around and say the one thing that we dislike in audio over general, whether we car or home audio, is lack of standards. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's basically what we're coming back to, right? Lack of like with the alternator, lack of standard. We don't really know what's going on with that thing. We can throw numbers out. But we have no idea what the standard is for that. Lack of standards with, with all of this. So even even distortion rating on amps really lacks standard. I, I, I mean, there are standards for it. Don't get me wrong. I don't like the standard personally because it's one watt, one kilohertz. What's your distortion rating? Okay. Right. But what's the likelihood of me pushing one watt unless I have 99 decibels? speakers I don't know. And, and what's the likelihood of me only playing a one kilohertz tone yeah well that's true and and there's not even really standards among people that test so there's no standard amongst what i do versus what derek does derek tests it in three steps um he ramps his voltage up to well above 15 so he can meet that 
that 14.4 rating, which to me, I mean, I, I don't know that I agree with that, but I understand why he's trying to do it because he wants to say the manufacturer says this is rated at 14.4 volts. He wants to try to meet that. Yeah. Me, I'm more like I'm putting this in my car. I'm starting out at 14.4 or 14.6 on the highest end. And we'll see where it goes from there. And I'll give you the rating at 13.8 if it drags my supply down that much in my battery bank. But you'll know that, yeah, it didn't make rated, but I only gave it 13.8 volts. So there's a little give and take there. And you should only expect to get 13.8 volts in your car unless you've got a you know beefed up system, uh, yeah. electrical charging system, batteries and, and whatnot. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm, I'm going to throw this out there, too. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this. I, I have a friend that that's uh, sometimes he doesn't listen. He's a great guy, but <laughs> the way he always listens. He wants for advice, but he doesn't doesn't always want to hear it. He just wants to believe what he wants to believe. And uh, one of those is uh, amplifier power and home audio receivers. Right. Most of the time when you see the amplifier rating and distortion rating, it's given at two channels driven. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you have a surround sound receiver, that's that can go seven or nine channels and it's, they're giving you the power rating at two. Uh, that's yeah. problematic. Now, a lot of times you can find in their manual, you can dig around and you can actually find the power rating of five, seven or nine speakers run. But, uh, you know, keep that in mind when they give that, because a receiver's two channel rating versus seven channel rating can be significantly different. In fact, one that might be lower on a two channel rating might still actually be higher on five or seven, depending on how they do it, do their um, power. So uh, that's one standard that we do do me and Derek both. And I put this in every video, all channels driven, but I don't explain it in every video. And I don't think people always understand what, what's going on. So specifically in, in a left four channel amp, you typically, unless it's a dual mono, you have one power supply. And the more, if you're pulling off every single channel at the same impedance, you're loading that power supply down more and you're likely to get less power overall. So Absolutely. every test we do is all channels driven, but you could certainly cheat by just driving two channels. You could do certain different tracks, you know, a quick bump. You could you could put it into hard clipping, have the gain up very high and just run a short burst and get a better, you know, score, so to speak, if you wanted to. Yeah, True Voice of Reason is talking about how there's a petition that you can sign to upgrade the amp, keep and upgrade the amp centers, and they, they need to be upgraded. I mean, it's just plain and simple. I think everyone agrees, whether it be home audio, car audio, whatever, it needs to be upgraded. Now, you know what you should do, Hi-Fi Vega? You should create one post on the forum that explains that, and you put some links in there, and then every video that you test that in, just link put it in your, it. yeah, link to it. That's what I would do, because it's, it, you can't re- you you can't explain that in every video. It's just not. No, it's not feasible. No, it's not feasible. The people that know it get tired of hearing it, and the people that don't know it, you're not going to spend enough time to yeah, to be able to care. explain it. To, well, or or <laughs> spend enough time to explain it to them yeah. well enough. But there, there is a rating board in the car audio called CEA two or CTA now two thousand six. So their rating has to meet. It's it's a bunch of different standards, but generally, they test it at forum stereo, and I believe maybe forums bridged. And if it meets those standards, uh, it's CTA rated. Even though at two one ohm, it could be completely different and not tested and still be CTA rated. Well, so did we got anything to finish on? Uh, no, I mean, another no, there's only like a couple minutes left. So, no. yeah, <laughs> well, I, I got I got one quick DIY audio guy had the uh, the plywood boxes as a dislike. Uh, yeah, uh, no. let's, we got we got just a minute or two left, so we're going. Here's the thing I know that we've all done it. Um, yeah. I've made a plywood box. Y'all both made a plywood box. It's not the plywood box that I dislike. I can't stand the sight of plywood in the grain on a speaker box. Uh, because most people, when they build a box out of plywood, they're not using that really sweet Baltic birch with the 10,000 layers that look really cool. 
most people are going and getting birch plywood from Home Depot or Lowe's. And it only, it's got three or four layers in it. It's perfectly fine plywood. It looks just fine. It's good for the speaker, but the edge grain of plywood, I just, I made my first home theater subwoofer five years ago and the edge grain stared at me for five years and I hated every minute of it. And I would like to see people do more to cover up the plywood plies on their subwoofer boxes. You know, if only they created that product called edge banding that they sell yeah. at Home Depot right next to the plywood that you buy. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the stuff that I used on my um, uh, computer build and just ironed it on, that stuff? Yeah. That's, I, I, sub, I submit to you the Gately box where you see a lot of plywood edges around every single subwoofer and absolutely looks like a work of art. Yeah, it looks nice. I, I, see, I, I don't mind the plywood. They're probably using nicer nicer plywood, too. And I don't even mind necessarily cheap plywood. As long as it has a good veneer on the outside, I, I'm not a big fan of just, you know, rough plywood. But right, right. Um, like yeah. even our Home Depot and Lowe's, you can buy like maple plywood, uh, birch plywood, things of that nature. And then if you go to like a woodworking store or a, or a marine store, then you can buy even higher grade stuff of you know marine grade ply or or woodworking ply and they have all kinds of different ones you can buy walnut all kinds yeah. of things i personally i like the i like ply edges it doesn't bother me at all i i like them more than edge banding because most people do not edge band very well that's you true see the, you can see the glue that's hard um, to do i because yeah. i worked I, I literally worked in a cabinet shop where we edge banded every day and that even then new people had a hard time getting it right. But when you get it right, it looks good, but people typically do it poorly. I'd rather see them just put a, a half inch or a three eighths inch round over on it, stain mm -hmm. it up nice and call it good. I think it looks nice. Yeah. Or chamfer or whatever. I mean, as long yeah. as you sand it well enough, I mean, that's always the issue. Cause if you're, if you're rough cutting or whatever and it, it's not sanded well, then, then it looks like yeah. junk. And I've completely switched over from MDF. I don't use MDF anymore at all. And if I want to do a cheap box, I just do the cabinet grade. The I forget what they call it. Uh, it's sanded ply, is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, sandy ply. Yeah. Yeah. So I just I use that stuff, and you, you used to be able to get it cheap until COVID. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> All right. So I think that is it. We've covered the topics pretty well. I don't know yeah. if we had a good balance of like to dislikes, but hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Yeah, I what think we spent more time on dislikes than likes. Yeah. Well, we I mean, have a lot to it's, say. It's it's easy to say. So so what do you guys got coming up? I know, Nick, I need to watch your video. Tell us about that and tell us about what you got coming up. Oh, no worries. Um, I'm going to start doing a series on, you know, these things that I, I think are, are frustrating for us. Um, and one of the videos I did is, you know, a lot of people believe that doubling your wattage equals doubling your perceived loudness. Uh, and that's not the case. So this video goes over that. It also goes over how much wattage you actually need. And then it also talks about SPL and its importance of SPL with wattage and how we really need to be careful with manufacturers pushing that wattage number because especially for newbies, they see that wattage number and that's what they want to buy instead of getting you know a good compliment. So uh, the things I got going on, um, I got that Cartesian audio. I'm going to try to do that this week as far as like a company overview, show you some of the, the speakers that they offer. I actually heard from um, Clement today who said that uh, he would like to come on the channel sometime. So I'm going to try to work on getting him on the channel, doing a live stream. Only thing is, you know, with us having such a lot, some people ask if he'd come on sound advice. I don't think so because I don't think the time difference, he's seven hours away from us, I believe. So at 7 p.m., what would that be like? Like two in the morning for him? So probably, probably not gonna, it'd probably be more like a morning show, like a 10 a.m. show. So maybe on the, maybe on a weekend or something, we can get together and do that where it's more like five o'clock for him and, you know, 10 a.m. for us. Yeah. Um, I showed you guys that I'll mention this to you guys real quick. This subwoofer, the reason why I built this is because I'm going to have so, this subwoofer coming out. It's unbelievable. It, it really is very nice for its size. If you need a really small, so this is like 0.35 cubic feet it's small. Um, and then uh, this is going to be built into the dinos. So the dinos are going to get this upgrade, which will be really cool. So they're going to start going passive radiator. Um, that's pretty much it. I do have, you know, I, I don't, 
I don't want to say it until I get my hands on it, but uh, I might have a really nice 12 inch subwoofer on my hands coming up soon. When I do, you guys will see it. And I think you car audio guys especially will really, really like it because it's a really, really cool speaker. Heck yeah. Can't wait to see that intro of the wall shaking. Uh, well, you might see the house falling down. <laughs> <laughs> so, Justin, I know you had a video. I did catch yours. Um, what, what else you got coming up? So the, the video that I dropped on Friday, I think, is a real good compliment to Nick's video. We joked about yes. it on last week's show, <laughs> uh, and we, we kind of covered similar concepts, uh, you know, the importance of power and, and the right way to evaluate power. I've already uh, posted next Friday's video uh, for my patrons, so my patrons get early access to that, and it's going to be a video where I bust myths about bandpass enclosures. We'll see bandpass. how that goes. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty fun about man pass yeah so i suggest you doing a very inflammatory headline going in all the base head pages posting it and that will be one of your most viewed videos in a short amount of time Post i have to go find the base head pages then i'm not myths sure which about wait myths about band passing oh but you're are. you're breaking the myths i'm gonna be doing some myth, yeah. myth buster yes. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, i'm gonna suggest the title you are now jamie heineman <laughs> you're wrong about band pass enclosures <laughs> That title. I just might have to redo the title because I'm, I, I'm not good at picking titles that get people yeah. to go crazy. So that's what you do. You, you just put it, put you're wrong about bound pass enclosures. Go to the base head pages, post it like crazy. Matter of fact, I'll do it for you because they already hate me over there a lot of times anyway. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'm not we'll on get... a lot of the base head forums. Uh, I'm not. Um, yeah. None of those really excited me. <laughs> so I've done a head unit review, a cheap one that's over here on the bench now. Um, watch the video. It's a oh, 25 hour yeah. head unit. Maybe worth it to you. May not be, but I've got another head unit coming up next week. I'm reviewing and I'm going to do a car audio version of the Dinas no. pretty soon. So that's going to be awesome. Be looking, be looking for that. And it's not, it's more in spirit than an exact replica. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, this has been Sound Advice. Next week we are on Nick's channel, Toy DIY. Yeah. And, and we'll actually even give you an idea of what it's about, just so you guys know. We're going to be talking about the myths you believe, lies and deception of manufacturers, lies and deceptions that you might believe that aren't necessarily true those types of things we're gonna be talking about so be kind of exciting right. justin well, you gotta have your video out by then bro it's, it's, be, it's already it's it, already scheduled it's already ready to go all right I, I, I've, I've been you know something's gonna happen it's not gonna come out right you yeah. know? <laughs> 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 that'd be a good subject to talk about maybe we can get some people mad and yeah that'd be fun <laughs> <laughs> all right guys we'll see you later